I suppose uh, this is with regard to the second script. Right. So the item selector goes between uh, the component called DF read library and the corresponding uh, material assigning components. I suppose in case uh, this doesn't work, one could also use a list item and connect it to a slider to select one of them. Um, are there questions related to installation? Um, because we will be using around five different plugins. It could be possible that uh, some of you may have problems installing a couple of them. Uh-huh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, I don't have uh, any ready-made installation uh, instruction. Uh, the links to the different plugins are mentioned in the workshop brief. If you follow the links, uh, each link has the separate instructions specific to that plugin uh, mentioned. Uh, Bardo, you haven't received the V transferring. I suppose you were added later. Uh, in the participation list. So I'm just gonna share the V transfer. Uh, yeah, I just pasted the V transfer link uh, in the chat. I'm gonna do it again because we had a couple of more messages added since then. Um, right, so I, I suppose we gotta wait five minutes or so for you guys to download the files from eTransfer. Uh, there is a particular question about uh, SHP components, right. Uh,
Well, uh, installing SHP itself uh, involves four different steps, wherein we basically have to do what it asks us to do, which is, uh, first of all, for the GH Python file, which is uh, the usual class of a plugin file, it needs to be saved in the components folder or needs to be dragged onto the Grasshopper canvas and then you restart trying on Grasshopper. And then along with that, you have to take care of these two steps. Uh, Joy, could you please yeah. post the link to the, all the panelists and the attendees? It, it's just sent to the panelists now. Uh, all right, yeah. Uh, this is the link to um, GH shapefile plugin, and this is the link as Matt has also shared. Uh, that's the link for to the vTransfer files. Uh, yes, Millie, we will go through how to link them and we won't necessarily use that file. That file, I've shared that file as sort of a worst case scenario in case uh, some of you cannot figure out uh, the GH shapefile component. Um, right, so as I was saying, so once you install uh, the GH Python file, uh, which gets installed the usual way that other plugins do, uh, then we also have to install this particular file, PYSHP, and then also extract the user objects and uh, save it in the user objects folder. Uh, I'm running Rhino 7. I haven't checked all the scripts with Rhino 6, but fundamentally there should not be a problem because uh, most of the uh, plugins were originally developed for Rhino 6. Uh, I'm not sure how many of these plugins work on Mac, which is um, also one of the limitations if you're using Mac as far as the whole uh, gambit of uh, Grasshopper plugins is concerned. Uh, not all plugins are released uh, in, in, in the format that is installable for Mac. Right, uh, I suppose we can head over to uh, the workflow. I'll just I'll share a brief introduction since uh, we are working uh, with limited amount of time. I'm not going to go into much detail about uh, the various concepts and the various thermal comfort indices that we are going to simulate and then calculate. I'll give a 
conceptual overview of which is which and when uh, it is suitable to use each of them. And then we'll directly head over to the use of NVMet through Grasshopper. Right, uh, before I share my screen with a brief presentation, are there any questions related to installation or Rhino version or uh, access to the workshop files? Uh, yeah, let's begin with the content of our workshop. Uh, it's, of course, titled uh, Urban Thermal Comfort, wherein we are going to calculate uh, various thermal comfort indices, for example, UTCI, PET, and PMV, which are composite indices which take into account various uh, variables that sort of interact with each other, which uh, indirectly tell us uh, the sensation of thermal comfort in, uh, in an urban space. Uh, I'll briefly introduce myself, um, Joy Mondol. I run a practice called Research Lab in India, and we offer design computation and simulation services to architecture practices across Southeast Asia. Um, Along with that, uh, we are really interested in developing specific uh, software solutions. We've already released a couple of uh, Grasshopper plugins, uh, one which is rather uh, artistic in nature, wherein uh, it sort of iterates Piet Monchin inspired uh, neoplastic compositions, both in 2D as well as 3D, which is, I guess, of specific interest to architects when they are at the very initial conceptual stage of design. Uh, the other plugin that we've released is uh, pretty utilitarian. It's called, uh, it's, it's used to automatically place columns and beams on orthogonal floor plans. So one doesn't need to, you know, uh, repeat what we manually uh, think and then and, and then run the parametric soft if else calculations in our head and then we place columns and beams and on orthogonal floor plans so, and by using this uh, plugin we no longer need to do that uh, coming to the specific topic of this workshop uh, we are basically <coughs> concerned about thermal comfort and in specific thermal comfort in an urban scenario. There are a variety of definitions of human comfort, thermal comfort and other similar overlapping intersecting terms. Uh, at the crux of it, uh, it's a rather uh, subjective uh, uh, sensation. Uh, it's a condition of how a human feels in it's in his or her environment. And there are various matrices or indices using which we can quantify them. Uh, essentially, it uh, is calculated by using six different variables, wherein which basically reflect the way our built environment, our climatic pa parameters, and how humans at a very individual level uh, interact with those forces. So it, it takes into account humidity, uh, wind speed, 
dry bulb temperature, radiant temperature, which basically means uh, temperature radiant from various surfaces built around us. And of course, uh, the insulation generated by the kind of clothing we have and our metabolic rate, uh, which means that if we are at a sedentary position, if we're seated, we'll probably not feel um, as uh, thermally stressed uh, compared to, let's say, if you're running around an area in the peak of the summer. Uh, the other question is why uh, do we need to calculate uh, thermal comfort? Uh, the answer to it is pretty obvious. Number one is to understand the spatial variation and the temporal variation of thermal comfort in an area. Uh, the other is uh, once we identify the spots which are not thermally comfortable, some spots may be too cold, some spots may be too hot. Once we identify those spots, we need to incorporate some green measures, be it through green roofing, um, adding trees, or using reflective pavements, or any other uh, standard green measure. Once we do introduce that in our design, we need to calculate the difference those measures will sort of lead to, which cannot really be calculated simply by simulating the temperature separately, the, uh, the humidity separately and the wind, wind speed separately. All of these not only have different ranges of numbers, temperature is in a different range, wind speed is in a different range, but also the, the units of these parameters or variables are different. So we basically need to calculate, uh, sort of use indices to calculate thermal comfort. Uh, the, these images are an example of Sao Paulo with uh, green measures uh, on the right and without green measures on the left at two different times. So not only do you see differences in thermal comfort between the two uh, timestamps, but you also see differences in thermal comfort between a design which doesn't incorporate any green measure and another design which does incorporate green measures. Let's briefly talk about the three indices that we're going to use or rather calculate after the simulation. Uh, the first one is uh, UTCI, full form being Universal Thermal Climate Index. Uh, it's the oldest method to measure heat stress in outdoor spaces. What it doesn't uh, take into account is the clothing insulation and the metabolic rate of the users of that space. So it, in, in a way, it doesn't take into account the human aspect of the variables. Uh, it only takes into account the, uh, the, only the environmental constraints. So it could be said that it's, it's, it's in a way the equivalent temperature as, as just one value, the equivalent temperature that will generate the same sensation in us as the environmental factors combined, which include humidity, wind speed, air temperature, and radiant temperature. Uh, of course, uh, the equivalent temperature that UTCA gives us uh, is also subcategorized into different stress categories. Uh, Typically, anything uh, above 26 degrees and anything below 9 degrees is considered to be rather stressful, uh, which is kind of self-evident in the table that's shown in the slide. I suppose uh, there is... Right. Uh, so since UTCI doesn't take into account uh, two very specific and rather important uh, 
aspects of the human experience uh, it was improved later on by another index called PET physiological equivalent temperature and it's used for measuring heat stress in the outdoor space as well but it is a more accurate representation of thermal comfort but because it also takes into account the clothing insulation and the metabolic rate. Uh, when we uh, search uh, the temperature of our locality you, you may notice that it says let's say 24 degrees however it feels like 17 degrees or it feels like 27 degrees. PET is actually a pretty robust model which can do that for us because not only does it incorporate the environmental factors but it also incorporates the the human factors uh, the 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 eventual number of this index the output could be taken as the feel like temperature of that area which we see when we google temperatures of different cities um, again, uh, the distribution is pretty straightforward uh, as far as uh, what are the different physiological stress levels are with respect to the PET temperature or the PET number. Uh, again, as a thumb rule, anything less than 13 and anything more than 29 is considered to be rather stressful, which basically means moderate, strong and extreme cold as well as heat stress uh, would be considered to be uh, beyond the comfort range. Uh, there's another one uh, called PMV, predicted mean vote, which is typically used for indoor environments where uh, cooling is done through uh, mechanical means. Uh, it doesn't tell us uh, a, a, an effective temperature range like UTCI does or like uh, PET does. Uh, what it does instead is that it tells us the collective satisfaction or dissatisfaction level of the occupants with regard to the human as well as environmental factors. Unlike UTCI and like PET, uh, PMB incorporates all the six variables. Uh, as a thumb rule, if you look at the table uh, on the bottom right, uh, moderate, strong and extreme, cold stress as well as heat stress uh, would be considered uh, under dissatisfaction level. And only between Side cold stress and slight heat stress, which basically means from let's say minus one or minus 0.5 to 0.5 or one, that range would be considered as satisfactory level. Uh, as the name says, predicted mean vote and not temperature. Uh, this is used uh, to sort of understand a, a collective. Uh, collective uh, understanding of the indoor climate. However, because uh, this tool can be used rather easily along with the other two, uh, we're going to sort of use this for outdoor uh, urban scenario as well in, in the exercise that we're going to begin in a while. Uh, so the workshop steps uh, would be basically number one, uh, we're gonna make a 3D using uh, a shape file. Uh, then we are gonna simulate the 3D after assigning uh, materials onto them. And the simulation is gonna tell us the primary attributes, which are basically the six variables. It'll, it'll tell us the metabolic rate, the clothing insulation, uh, humidity, air speed, air temperature, and radiant temperature. And then once the simulation is done with those six values across our grid, so each grid cell will have a different set of values, 
using the simulation output, uh, finally, we're going to use a third script to combine these to calculate UTCI, PET, and PMV. Right. Um, having said that, let's uh, head over to the website. From where we can download uh, shape files. I'm gonna paste the link in the chat. And um, so once you're here, you have to make sure that you select shape file as a file type of the download or the format. And then, of course, you're going to type uh, the name of the city or the area for which you want the information. So if I go to New York. Okay, so I suppose we have to manually move around. So yeah. Then you have to create, let's say, this rectangle which basically controls uh, the extent to which uh, the data will be given to you. I'll say that uh, as a thumb rule, let's restrict it to a pretty small area because uh, unlike let's say Ecotech or uh, regular indoor energy simulations, um, we met takes a uh, a lot of time to render the output. So since we're basically talking about a demonstration of the process, uh, let's make sure that we stick to a pretty small area. And then you basically need to type in your email ID. And I suppose click on extract. And then it'll tell you that you can monitor the status of your request on the service status page. So I can click on service status. And then download one of them. I'm pretty sure a lot of you know how this works. And then once the wait period is done, it's uh, concluded, you can download the shape file from here. Um, what I've also done is that within the V transfer folder, I have created a folder named shape file underscore example. And you'll find a scene that is already extracted. And then in case for some reason the, the website doesn't work out for you or somehow you've selected the region which is too large and it's taking a lot of time to download, then you can use this as an alternative. Um, so I'll give you guys a couple of minutes uh, for you to download your extractions.
Right. Uh, Aaron has a question, and that is human factors uh, vary person by person, and how does PET or let's say uh, the other one, PMV, account for this? Um, thankfully, the way Grasshopper works is that we can iterate those values and then uh, how, let's say, person A will experience, thermally experience an urban scene will be different compared to how person B, who may have a different metabolic rate or clothing level or both, uh, how that person will thermally experience the urban scene can be sort of iterated. So if you have, let's say, uh, usually uh, when we are simulating these for the purpose of research or even for um, uh, professional exercises, these are not varied. However, if at all there is a task where you want to sort of quantify the difference with regard to these two parameters, you can any day uh, change the input value for these two and then the entire uh, urban scene will have a different uh, thermal comfort output, be it for PET or PMB. Um, as I mentioned, UTCI doesn't have these two factors incorporated, so these won't really make any difference as far as UTCI values are concerned. Right, uh, let's go over to the first script, which is uh, one underscore shapefile to 3D. And either you can use uh, the shape files that you have downloaded, or you can use the one that I have shared, uh, which is inside this particular folder. And uh, for some of you, uh, this particular plugin is not working at the moment. Uh, it's just a matter of being patient and going through the instructions on the website and installing this. Uh, it's not a difficult plugin to use. So I guess once the workshop is concluded, you can install it and then try it for yourself. Um, let me explain what are the components of this. V, um, basically have three different inputs. And for buildings, we'll have a fourth input, which would be the floor to floor height. The first input is the shape file folder which in my case, I'm using the files that I've already shared with you. So I'm just gonna simply copy paste uh, the file location. And the second input is the list of the file types. For that, what we can do is we can simply note down the different components within this scene. Certain urban scenes will have water. This one doesn't. Uh, this only has bare buildings, construction, paved, and vegetation. So bare buildings, construction, paved, and vegetation. In case it had water, you would have needed to type water, uh, but I mean, that is not the case here. 
So we'll skip that. Um, this particular slider, I am crossly assuming that all of us have used Grasshopper before. If not to an expert level, at least spent few hours in Grasshopper and they're comfortable with the interface. Um, right, so this slider basically uh, selects which file type we need to uh, reflect in, in Rhino or write in Rhino. Let's first begin with bare. So I'm going to use zero here. And then through the connections and um, by using the component from the this particular plugin, uh, we get two kinds of outputs. One is for flat surfaces or any surface and the other is for buildings. Now, bear would mean, I guess, parts of the urban scene, which are basically soil, do not have vegetation, do not have grass, are not paved, do not have buildings, is not water. So this would be a surface. So we have to bake this. Let me unhide this and we can go to perspective. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep making uh, the right layers. So this is bare. So I'm going to make a layer named bare and bake the surfaces into bare. And then we can zoom into the baked surfaces. Um, the second is buildings. So we are going to move it to one from zero. And if I head back to this end, if I briefly talk about what, what are the outputs of um, this particular component. Uh, geometry, of course, uh, gives us the curve. Uh, be it for flat surfaces or even for buildings. And along with that, uh, we have another uh, output called records, which will have the metadata of the geometry that may be baked. Only in the case of buildings, uh, do we have two different kinds of metadata. The first one being the ID of the geometry and the other one being the number of flows. Um, so through basically through list item, uh, we can extract the number of flows corresponding to each of the geometries. And over here in this slider, we can control the floor height. Of course, there is no information as to how flow to floor height varies between different buildings, but these are just some restrictions that we need to work with as far as uh, extracting spatial data from maps is concerned. I'm just going to use, uh, let's say, 3.5. And then I'm going to make another layer called buildings. And then I'm going to go through the other data types as well. Construction. And then we have paved. might have big 
construction data into billing. So let me redo that. Then we go to paved. Uh, the fourth one is rather the fifth one at the fourth in at four as index value is vegetation and we are going to make that as well so once this is done we can sort of visualize the urban scene it seems like we have to medium-sized uh, towers over here, some regular housing towards here and on this side as well, and few informal settlements on this side. Of course, uh, for a better reading of the scene, we can change the colors, uh, but I wouldn't spend uh, too much time on it. I could also change bear to let's say yellow. Right, so this becomes a scene. Right, so in case uh, the height data was not extracted, uh, of course, then we have to go into some sort of assumption. Uh, you could take, uh, let's say any average value for the number of floors and then multiply the floor to floor height to make the extrusions. Or alternatively, uh, the best way or, or, or a way to get the floor to floor heights for sure is to use uh, one of the GIS software. Uh, so you won't really be handicapped by how much of data OpenStreetMap has documented. Right, in case uh, this particular plugin wasn't working for you, which is, I suppose, the case with a few of you, uh, you can either make a scene like this or use any design uh, that you've modeled. And the size is around 200 meters by 200 meters. Uh, I had not changed the units. So I'm going to do that. You can change the units and then proceed. Uh, what I'm going to do, because uh, some of you couldn't use this particular um, plugin, I'm going to use uh, the Rhino file that I had shared to sort of proceed with the rest of our exercise. Yes, units uh, should be in need. Uh, I'm going to use this. to work with the rest of the exercise. Uh, for that, of course, we have to use uh, the second definition or the second script, <clears throat> which I had saved as two underscore, underscore simulation.
And I'm going to give you guys about five minutes in case the plugin was working or in case you wish to work with a different urban scene. Uh, open uh, your personal files and make sure you slice out the chunk, which is around 200 meters by 200 meters. Um, and we'll start with the explanation of the second script. And what are the different components that go into this particular script? And how the script can be varied from one case to the other. We're going to cover those in about five minutes' time. Meanwhile, if you have questions, uh, be it technical or conceptual, uh, please uh, write it in the chat window. There's something else. Uh, yeah. Please write it either in the chat window or the Q&A window. I am checking both of them intermittently. Right, so in about five minutes time, we'll begin with the simulation. Hey, Joy, this is David.
Um, no, NVMet components are not native to Ladybug. You have to install Dragonfly. Uh, I'll share the link. <clears throat> Right, so if you have drag and play, that will take care of it. Yes, the base surface needs to go beyond uh, the, the urban scene by about two grid points, which is why you'll find that it's slightly larger than the pounding box of the urban scene. I, I hope some of you do have Dragonfly installed uh, so that we can begin the process of simulation. Right, uh, before we head over to connecting the different, let's say different kinds of surfaces and then assigning materials, let's first discuss uh, the different uh, steps we need to incorporate to set up the process. Uh, the first one is to assign a workspace folder where all the simulation files and the results will be saved. Um, it is advisable to make this folder in the C drive. Uh, so what I've done is I've made a folder. Yeah, Mehdi, if you could, uh, Type your question in the Q&A. Right, I've made a folder in the C drive. And along with that, we need to add a project name as well. So let's say within the same uh, urban scene, we may assign different combinations of material. So the project name needs to be changed according to those to not only save the results in different folders, but also for us to uh, sort of look back and understand which folder has which result later on as well. So we may come back to the, these simulation output after let's say a month or two. And then as is the case with grasshopper files, unless you arrange them in the right manner, uh, uh, which in this case would mean name the folders properly, unless you do that, it may be difficult for us to understand later on. So no green measure. Uh, no, NVMet doesn't have a CFD engine. It uses a differential calculus to sort of calculate how wind bounces between different surfaces. Uh, there is a restriction as far as the free NVMet version is concerned. Uh, we can use a maximum of 50 grid units by 50 grid units 
on x and y and i guess 50 in z as well so in that regard unless we have the full version we are restricted to 50 by 50 by 50. so the grid size would basically depend on the size of your scene i'm using 200 meters by 200 meters so roughly it will be around four meters each grid size would be four meters by four meters and uh, NVMet doesn't take the explicit shape of the geometry. It sort of pixelates it and then runs the simulation. And we'll see that in a while. Uh, I'll just go through the steps. <clears throat> um, the third input is the EPW file, which is basically the weather file of the location where the urban scene is located. I'm using uh, Kolkata as the location. I'm in Kolkata at the moment. You can download the EPW file to any locality or any city that you wish to. Um, once this is done, then uh, we get to connecting the different surface components to the geometry in Rhino. Um, in case you don't have any EPW file downloaded. You can use the one that I've shared in the vTransfer folder. Um, right, so beyond the geometries that we have downloaded, or rather uh, the geometries that we've read from the shape files, uh, we need a base surface which goes beyond the extents of the urban scene. And it needs to go beyond the extent by about one or two grid cells so that the edge conditions are not simulated as literal edge conditions. There is a buffer grid cell towards the outside so that there are there's data neighboring to the actual uh, edge condition. Uh, I've made the surface uh, in the Rhino file that I've shared with you and let's connect this. If it is indeed in millimeters, I need to change it to meters, my bad. All right, so we connect the base surface and the rest need to be connected uh from the different layers so let me connect the buildings bear Um, construction. Pavement and vegetation. Remember, we don't have any water in this particular scene. So this will basically be not used. Right, so once these are connected, 
uh, before we discuss how materials can be assigned, let's first go ahead and look at this particular component, which generates data for NVMet. And if we double click on the Boolean toggle, what you'll notice is that the grid distribution has been divided all along. Um, if I go to the front view, you'll notice that the number of cells in the Z direction right now is such that it doesn't go beyond the top of the tallest building. In fact, it ends before the tallest building ends. So of course we need to extend the number of cells in the Z direction, which we can control from here from this particular component called TF and we met grid. And this particular input called number cells Z, uh, we can vary this input to add more number of grid cells. Um, the thumb rule is that we need to have two layers of grid cells beyond the top of the tallest building. So in this particular case, I need to use nine as the value. And of course you can reduce the dimension of Z. And if you do so, the number of cells would need to be readjusted accordingly so that you have two more. But for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to stick to a size of 15 in Z axis and nine, sorry, yeah, nine cells in the Z axis. Uh, we could have reduced it to five or six, but that would mean that the number of cells to be simulated would be increased, which would mean that the simulation time will be increased. And I just want to demonstrate the process, that's the focus. Uh, you can always increase the number of grid cells and simulate uh, the output later on. Um, of course, uh, you can control the dimension of the cells in the X and the Y axis as well. I'm keeping it at six, I'm not changing it. Right, so just these few things that we need to make sure of. Number one is that the offset surface, base surface needs to be offset outside the urban scene extents so that our grid cells basically have a spillover. And secondly, as I mentioned, the number of grid cells in the vertical direction needs to be at least two more beyond the top of the tallest building. Once uh, this is taken care of, let's just see why this is, <clears throat> right. Now uh, let's talk about material. What are the different materials? How can we set materials? So on and so forth. Before doing that, what I'm going to do is uh, the input for environment objects, which basically has all the geometries and the materials as the input. I'm going to disconnect it because we're going to make new connections. So the first question is, what are the by default uh, material types that are available to us? Um, for that, what we can do is we can open NVMet and go through the list. So 
So once you open NVMet, uh, in the top menu, you'll find data and settings right next to the first option, which is NVMet. And within that, <coughs> the second option, database manager, if you double click on that, it will open a window with all the possible materials displayed. Um, so let's say within vaults, you have cement and concrete within which you have materials of different specifications. Uh, you have glass uh, and different roofing material within vaults. Within soil, uh, there are different kinds of course, uh, be it, of course, water, um, asphalt, which basically represents road, and then various kinds of natural soils. Um, in profiles, again, you have a variety of pavements and another one which explicitly says asphalt road. So probably we could use this if we have to add roads uh, as material and etc. and etc. There's a bunch of materials available. You can go through them one by one later on. Um, so once we, let's say, identify which material we want to use, then uh, we have to head back to <clears throat> we have to head back to uh, grasshopper and use this these three sets to assign different kinds of material. So let's say we want to assign a material to the pavement surfaces. What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this set and here if I let me share my entire screen so if we have to uh, find pavements it is within uh, the pop-up window called profiles. And then you have uh, different kinds of pavements. Once we identify the material, we basically need to remember what is the name of the pop-up window, which in this case is profiles. And then in grasshopper, in select material, we have to type in the name of that pop-up window. And within profile, we have to, let's say type, sorry, uh, in search material, we have to type pavement. And once we do that, if we connect a panel to the description, Then we start seeing the different options we have for pavement. Um, since this scene doesn't have a, uh, a layer or data related to road separately, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that the pavement, the shape file, which is called pavement is basically road because I am, I, I know this area. So I know that what is 
stored as PIF is actually uh, root. So instead of pavement, I'm going to type root and then uh, pick one of these as the root material. Uh, the description output tells us basically the names of the material. So it's not really descriptive, so to speak. We can connect the third output called XML and go through the various specifications. The one which is the most important is called albedo, which basically is a measurement of how much of heat and light would be reflected by that particular material or that surface. It could sort of assume it to be similar to reflectivity. Um, the other way to sort of explode these is if I drag it to the bottom, there's a different set of um, components I've arranged here where you can take the output of output XML of any such component connected to XML of this one. And it will only pick the ID, the description and the albedo value of that particular material. So the regular asphalt road has the least amount of reflectivity, which basically means that it absorbs the highest amount of energy, which consequently means that it would increase the thermal discomfort in the area and it would sort of nudge the sensation into the heated stressful category. And if you look at the seventh and the eighth options, asphalt road with red coating, those are the ones which have increased albedo 0.5 and 0.5. And beyond that, we have other options which have reflectivity as high as 0.8 or 80%. Uh, when we talk about green measures, these are the kind of improvements we can make. Uh, now, one may ask, how can we use materials with uh, custom values? That can be done in, in NVMet. You basically have to save a new custom material, save it to the right uh, pop-up menu option with the right values and then those can be called into grasshopper so again just to revise uh you have to sort of go through the pop-up windows here note the name of the pop-up window particular to that material go back to grasshopper and select material this needs to correspond to the name of the pop-up window and this one needs to be the material name by which the properties need to be searched and then you can connect the xml into the xml of xml reader and it will tell you the albedo value and, and the corresponding number or the corresponding material that we need to select um, Right, so uh, for road, I'm going to select the first kind, the first asphalt kind, because we're simulating this without any uh, green measure. And once this material is selected, now we need to, in a way, map this material onto our geometry. 
uh, there are two components for mapping, rather three components for making, mapping, which are predominantly used. One is the NVMet buildings component, which obviously takes care of buildings where we can have different wall material, roof material, and of course also green wall material and green roof material. Uh, <clears throat> for flat horizontal surfaces, be it road or pavement, um, water for that matter, or, or bare soil, we use this particular component called NVMet soil. And the third kind is 2D plan, which basically tells NVMet that this is neither a building nor a soil. Instead, it's, it's plant with uh, evaporative uh, functionality. And then accordingly, it simulates different features for those grid cells. Um, right, so let me copy this. And and we met soil, and this is the profile ID. So let me connect that. And for the first input soil, we need to connect pavement. Then it makes sure that the data saved in pavement is being assigned the material sorry, the material type road within which the specific material is asphalt road. And similarly, we can have connections of a variety of them, wherein we can select wall and which kind of concrete soil and which kind of clay, uh, which kind of plant, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, We are not using water at the moment. So for the time being, I'm going to I am going to delete the components corresponding to water. And for buildings, the geometry connected is, of course, buildings. I am going to put them in the right order. Uh, so this was I'm going to get rid of this because the same is done over here as well. So pavement goes into road, building goes into building, bear goes into soil clay. Um, vegetation goes into plant from within plant and there are a variety of plants from which you can select the first one has uh, I guess grass uh, let me go through these Yeah, the first one is 50 centimeter on average uh, dense grass. So for vegetation, for the time being, we're using grass instead of trees. And the only thing uh, that is not connected at the moment is construction. It has two surfaces in the urban scene. So what we can do is uh, we can make another set of these and assign a material to construction or we can paste these three and assign concrete into construction as well, which is what I'm going to do. Uh, 
and we need to <coughs> copy paste this to replace the profile ID with wall concrete or alternatively you could have directly connected this here and we won't need these components all over again but for the input of geometry which is called soil in this particular case we will connect construction into soil right so we have five different reference components and so correspondingly we have five different material assigning components out of which two of the geometry sets have the same uh, material we've used concrete for the walls of the buildings and concrete to the construction patches as well so we have four material selectors for the four components which apply the material to the geometries. Uh, yeah, XML reader doesn't work with those because uh, these tag names need to be changed for those. For that, you need to basically uh, look at the XML over here, make sure that the tag names are right so the tag names would be the metadata written within these brackets. So ID, description, albedo, height, et cetera, et cetera. These need to be in the, these need to be spelled right. So not all of them would have the same metadata. So depending on which one you're connecting, then you'll need to sort of change that input to the uh, sort of the metadata tag that you wish to see. Um, right, so once we have these five connected, uh, the all of them go into environment objects within NVMet spaces. So let me connect all of them one by one. Um, once this connection is made, uh, we can run a preview of the NVMet file that was just made, made uh, by turning the toggle of this Boolean function. And that is going to open this NVMet file. And as you can see, it has pixelated the geometries, as I was saying, and we met is not capable or it has not been made in a manner to explicitly model surfaces at an angle or model uh, double curve surfaces by default. It will always voxelate in 3D and pixelate in 2D. What we can do is we can click on this icon on the top left top left of this graphic and it will show us the 3D and as you can see the vegetation has been given a grid cell and the buildings basically have been pixelated depending on their heights and the number of grid cells that they occupy and here we can select this particular option soil and surface on the left to see how different materials have been assigned. So we have the road and the bare material, which is soil, which is uh, shown in, I guess, jet black. But the overall sense that we need to 
make over here is that the corresponding geometries visually uh, appear to be at the right place and there's no error in transmitting the data from um, Rhino to NVMet. So if, as in how you select these different options, the display would change. If it's soil and surface, it'll show you the soil types as well, be it road or, or pavement or bare or water, had we been using water in the space. And if you click on buildings, it'll just show you a simple wireframe model as far as the soil is concerned. All right, I am going to toggle it back to false because each time I would make a change anywhere here, this would get prompted again and keep popping up windows one after the other. All right, so we've, we've seen how to A, make the right kind of folders, B, figure out the grid size, C, refer the geometries and assign material to them. And then sort of export uh, NVMet working file for the simulation to be ready. Now, when we say grass, it, it, it incorporates what soil would be under the grass. So if let's say uh, we want to simulate it for a particular kind of uh, combination of grass and soil, which is not typically present in the material repository, then we have to go to NVMet and assign a new material with those uh, values. What we need to remember is that uh, it doesn't literally model the grass, right? Like we do when we take renderings of um, designs. It basically translates each grid cell in terms of numbers or attributes of the material there. So um, we don't need two layers of those. The combined effect of grass and soil is incorporated in that kind of grass. Ah, uh, yeah. Coming back to uh, yes, uh, we'll we'll take care of three D canopies. Uh, when in the next run, when we'll incorporate a couple of green meshes, where we'll turn the asphalt into red coated, and then we'll sort of add, let's say. 3D trees in portions where we have uh, bare soil. We'll, we'll get to that in a bit. <clears throat> right, so once we have the um, file previewed, then we need to tell NVMet uh, the day and the hour at which the simulation needs to be done, but obvious, right? Uh, that gets controlled by these set of components. I guess these are pretty straightforward. Uh, you mentioned the day of the month, the month of the year, and the hour of the day. Uh, I've kept it at 15. And depending on when you want to simulate it, it could also do it for the night. Uh, there are certain parts uh, on our planet where nights tend to be warmer and more uncomfortable compared to the daytime. So in those places, uh, simulating it for the nighttime would be uh, more sensible. Uh, All right, yeah, so in NVMet, you can change the kind of soil and save it as a different material. Like I mentioned, by default, it will incorporate the properties of soil as well. In case the property of soil that gets incorporated needs to be changed, you'll 
just need to make a new material in NVMet and it'll be reflected in Grasshopper. Right, so once we assign the R at which the simulation needs to begin, the other one which we need to control is the duration of the simulation. How many hours do we want it to be simulated? Uh, we may want results for 24 hours at a stretch. In that case, our simulation duration would be changed to 24. Uh, given the grid size I've used, simulation for even one hour will take 15 to 30 minutes, depending on uh, the system configuration of your laptop or, or your machine. So when we are talking about 24 hours of simulation, it does take about five hours or more, again, depending on the configuration of the machine. Uh, as far as uh, research work is concerned, what typically gets done is, if you have to simulate for three hours, you have to simulate for 24 hours prior to that as well. And why that is done? It's because to understand the credibility of the output of the simulation, a 24 hour buffer is taken in front of the actual results that we are worried about. The 24 hour buffer is taken to let the simulation engine sort of get stabilized towards more accurate results. Now, again, what does this mean? If we have, if you simulate it for only an hour, it will simply take uh, the temperature or the reference humidity of that particular hour and give us an instantaneous result, which may not be really reflective of the ground condition because we are concerned about heat island effect as well, right? So patches between buildings may be hotter or patches between buildings may be colder. If we take only an instant of an hour and simulate, the buildup of the previous hours will not be incorporated. So, so as far as research work is concerned, as a safe practice, 24 hours of simulations are added uh, on top of the actual hours that we wish to simulate it for. So for example, if we want results from 1 a.m. to 11 a.m. in the morning, we have to start the simulation from 1 a.m. the previous day, let it run for 24 hours of simulation duration so that the effect of uh, heat in that urban scenario gets accumulated for it to be reflected from the first hour of the actual result that we are worried about, which is in the example from 1 a.m. Uh, if we directly started from 1 a.m., the effect of the heat accumulation or dissemination of the previous hours won't be reflected. But again, because we are under time constraint, for, we can't really add the 24 hour buffer. So we're going to stick to one. So again, if we have to simulate it for only one hour, this actual duration needs to be 24 hours. And this needs to be set one day prior. Anyway, for the moment, we're going to stick to one. And then we simply need to double click, turn this to true generates the simulation file. And if you sort of go to the folder before I hit the simulation, uh, you'll start seeing files being written, files which NVMet will use to simulate the results. Um, and then we can turn this toggle to 
true and it will start simulating. So I guess on my machine, it's going to take about 15 minutes time to run the simulation. So after the, after the first few seconds, you'll see this diagram, which basically means it has read the data correctly and these symbols represent what kind of data it's reading. And so beyond this, it'll, it'll take turns to write different kinds of output, uh, one set for the atmosphere, one set for the buildings, one set for soil, etc., cetera, and et cetera. Uh, which you will see in this particular file, which I've shared with you uh, within result underscore example. If you go to the first folder, you'll see an example of different kinds of output. Uh, so atmosphere has, in this particular case, hourly output of various atmospheric values. Uh, of course, similarly, buildings has data assigned to it, soil, surface, vegetation, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm going to let it run for a while. And then I guess in about 10 minutes time, we can start discussing how to read the results, how to calculate the different indices. Um, yeah, and I hope that at least some of you are able to start the simulation on your systems as well. Right, so now as you see it, has started to tell us the amount of time taken for each step of the simulation. Uh, well, we don't use Dragonfly, so to speak, uh, in the manner that it gets clear that, hey, we're using Dragonfly here. Each of these components are from Dragonfly DF, uh, prefix basically means dragonfly and then nv met configuration. All of these components are from dragonfly. Yeah, that's right, Eric. It's legacy dragonfly. Uh, we are going to use outdoor comfort calculation from Ladybug, but uh, the results differ uh, for a day's simulation, uh, like I said, depending on the capability of your laptop, it may take anywhere between, I would say, three hours to 12 hours. Uh, a month simulation is typically not done on a single system. Uh, we use uh, the network to run the simulation. Uh, if you don't have that, you basically you can multiply, let's say six hours by 24. So a total of four days continuous for a month simulation on a decent laptop. Uh, yeah, 
which be, which also means that unfortunately the way envymet works at the moment the amount of time it takes to run the simulations uh we cannot really connect it to a, a parametric optimization component we cannot be connected to galapagos one iteration itself will take 15 minutes or 10 minutes so um no i haven't tried this this particular kind of simulation with the uh, new components uh, do you see any remarkable difference uh, with the uh, new components uh, the time consuming part is that it needs to calculate all sorts of uh, let's say output for each of the grid cells so i mean you have multiple uh, simulations running it's i mean one simulation is actually calculating the output for multiple variables so atmosphere itself has about 40 different uh variables or parameters or results that we can extract uh, in the later stage and each one will have different uh, number of uh output parameters in their own right right yeah okay fine i'll i'll share uh, the uh connections related to air temperature and humidity um so on and so forth uh i'll just let this particular simulation be concluded what we're going to do is i'll i let the simulation be concluded take the uh, result and show the third script as well and then before we run a simulation incorporating the green measures as well i'll explain the 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 initial air temperature and rel relative humidity connection as well uh right in case uh the entire workflow has been rewritten i i'll have to uh spend some time on it i haven't so i am not at a position to make any informed comment on the comparison between the two workflows uh would you happen to know if the simulation time has also reduced along with change of uh, workflow uh i've i've i had paused sharing my video to sort of free up space for the system for to take care of the simulation and seems like <clears throat> yeah seems like the data has been saved so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and visualize the data and then we'll get back to um these connections uh initial temperature and relative humidity
Um, as far as reading the result is concerned, we need to take care of predominantly two things. One is the EPW file needs to be specified over here as well. Um, and the other is that the result folder needs to be mentioned. If I share my entire screen, Uh, if you go to the folder where the files were written, you'll see a folder named dragonfly config underscore output. And if you go inside that, you'll find the different folders which are relevant to us. So I'm going to copy the address to this folder and paste it here. And we start seeing some of the output. And of course, as expected, um, patches between buildings appear to be trapping heat. Uh, In case we had simulated it for more than an hour, we would have different values. And then we would need to use a slider to pick the values for that corresponding hour, which I'll show later on uh, towards the end of the workshop. Um, someone had asked that, why does it take so much time to simulate uh, if I just hover my mouse over the input variable for NVMet reader. You notice that it calculates uh, 35 different variables, which basically means that for each crit cell, not only in the X and the Y directions, but also in the Z direction, it needs to calculate 35 such values for those mini grid sets, which is why it sort of took about 10 minutes or so on my system. Uh, the variables that we are concerned with are uh, variable number eight, air temperature, uh, I guess variable number four, wind speed, uh, variable number 12, relative humidity, and variable number 26, mean radiant temperature, which is basically what's mentioned over here, variables 8, 26, 12, and 4. Out of curiosity, if you want to see what are the numbers or the output uh, distribution of any other variable, uh, feel free to edit this input list and you'll get the output accordingly. Um, so depending on the number of variables that we want to extract from the output, uh, this particular component gives us those many number of, uh, let's say, those many chunks of different files to visualize which uh, with, with the explode data uh, uh, component uh, I've sort of distributed to four different kinds of result visualization uh, components or, or result extracting components. Now, 
No, I, there's no way to reduce it because these are all interdependent simulations, which is what makes NVMet different from many of the other simulation software. Um, usually we, and when I say we, I mean architects, uh, since I am an architect, we tend to use uh, software which work in silos. One would only take care of wind, one would only take care of temperature, one would only take care of daylight, one would only take care of radiation. But in reality, uh, thermal sensation doesn't work that way. Uh, all of them need to be uh, simulated at the same time because there's a distinct correlation between one and the other, which is why we can't really reduce the simulation time like that. <clears throat> um, yeah, so since the first one is connected to the first variable, which is variable number eight, this tells us the driver temperature. And we don't even need to, con sorry, compute or calculate any of the indices. We can directly see the variance of dry bulb temperature by connecting the analysis result into this color mesh. Similarly, we can directly connect mean radiant temperature. Let me connect the mean radiant temperature because typically dry bulb temperature doesn't tend to vary from one place to the other. Uh, mean radiant temperature does tend to vary from one place to the other. To the other. So I'm going to connect the analysis result to analysis result of color mesh and this, uh, I think the height seems to be Uh, no, the mean radiant temperature doesn't change over here as well, uh, which is what I, I was uh, explaining. If you do it for only an hour, uh, the residual effect of the hours gone by before that particular hour uh, doesn't get reflected in the result, which is why you're seeing that radiant temperature and, uh, sorry, tribal temperature wouldn't vary anymore, which is why you see that radiant temperature won't vary much, uh, nor does relative humidity. The only thing that does vary is wind speed, which is what you'll see when you connect it to analysis result. Had we simulated it for, let's say 25 hours, of course, we would see the variance. Um, even if we had simulated it for six hours or five hours, even though not as close to reality, we would still start seeing variance for those output. Now, instead of seeing the result of wind speed, let's, let's connect them to each of the thermal indices. Um, it makes sense to look at those direction results. If I suppose you have buildings which have um, which have balconies uh, which are frequently used. Uh, otherwise, if, if most of your designs are enclosed and completely mechanically ventilated, then it doesn't make much sense to look at XZ and YZ results other than the effect of generating uh, cool graphics. Uh, let's begin with this. The one uh, at the bottom most uh, calculates the universal thermal climate index. 
And as I mentioned, it has only four input, tri-bulb temperature, mean radiant temperature, wind speed, and relative humidity. It doesn't take into account metabolism and clothing. Uh, let's go ahead and connect these. So dry bulb temperature result goes to dry bulb <clears throat> mean radiant humidity and wind speed. Once we connect those four and in run it, we need to connect the toggle and turn it to true. We'll start seeing a variety of output. The first one being the thermal climate index, which is, as I mentioned, the effective temperature for the environmental parameters, excluding the personal parameters. The other is what percentage of people would be, or rather, uh, for each cell, would someone be comfortable or not? And if it's zero, then that person is not comfortable. If it's one, then that person happens to be comfortable in that area. Um, I'm not sure what this question means. Wind speed from one direction or eight directions or 16 directions. The wind speed is uh, not really restricted in that manner. Uh, if we go to variables, You go to variable and extract the sixth variable, which would be the wind direction. You'll see that it's not restricted to X, Y, Z or eight or uh, 16 uh, quantized directions. It's 360, 360.59, 360 it's just, it's numbers. It's not restricted to Cartesian directions or 45 degrees between them. And then there are other outputs as to uh, if a person is feeling thermal stress or not, and what is the condition of that particular person, so on and so forth. What we can do is we can connect the output of universal thermal climate index to the analysis result. And it will tell us the variation of, uh, and I need to change this to, UTCI. It will tell us the variation of the distribution of values for UTCI. Uh, metabolism and clothing were, are not typically considered for UTCI. Uh, when the moment you consider those two, changes from UTCI to <clears throat> PET, which we're going to cover now, which is this particular one at the top. And this gives us the output of PET. Now, even here in this particular component, thermal comfort indices, uh, if you keep your cursor on top of the first input, comfort index, you'll find a variety of indices that could be calculated out of which we are interested in 15th, sorry, 16th and 17th, which have index values 15 and 16, PET for temperate climates and PET for tropical and subtropical humid climates. 
the particular weather file that I'm using, that particular city has a humid climate, uh, which is why I've used a slider value of 16. If the location you've picked doesn't have a humid climate, you may change it to 15. And the rest of the connections are pretty straightforward. You have drive out temperature, mean radiant, relative humidity, and wind speed. There's another one called body characteristics, which basically would include metabolism and clothing. That is taken care, care by another component called quite literally body characteristics, wherein you can mention age, height, weight, position, clothing, insulation, uh, metabolic rate. These are the two that uh, would be more important. Uh, if you keep your cursor on top of each of the inputs, you'll see uh, guides being mentioned wherein uh, for winter clothing, it's, it's three and above. For summer clothing, it's 0.5 and lower, so on and so forth. So depending on the uh, time of the year and the location, these values could be changed. And of course, metabolic rate has an extensive guide for us. Someone was asking earlier, how would it vary if we change the metabolic rate? Uh, let's see how it would vary. It can go from 0.8 to 9.5. Let's see. When it's 0.8, the Average value is 21.30. And when it's 9.5, it has reduced to 17.79. So some of it some parts have gone into the stressful category in this particular case. Right, so which basically means that it's not a variable. It's, it's, it's a constant, which is not the case. We, the other indices take it as a variable as well. Uh, by default, the metabolic rate is taken as uh, 2.32, uh, which corresponds to walking. Uh, the outputs for this would be, of course, the exact PET values. And along with that, it would also tell us the PET levels, where as, as the pop-up window says, and different categories would mean different levels of comfort. And then of course, there are uh, other output which sort of simplify the calculation for us. Uh, that is if a person is comfortable or not, it seems like in most of the grid cells, a person would not be comfortable and uh, et cetera and et cetera. Lastly, if we go to the PMV calculator, this also has <clears throat> the four environmental factors and the two human factors as variables. So let's go ahead and connect dry bulb into dry bulb. 
mean radiant to mean radiant <clears throat> And wind speed goes to wind speed. Uh, you can use a slider to connect uh, a metabolic rate, which I use the same as here, which corresponds to walking. So I'll use 2.32. And clothing level as uh, the guide says it could vary from <clears throat> one to four, sorry, zero to four. Uh, I'm going to stick to a value of one. And the output of this. My bad, I think this is no. And then it gives us uh, the predicted mean vote as well, which of course varies from minus three to plus three. It seems like a lot of the values are in the 0.6 range, which is between neutral and it's in fact within the acceptable range. So here you start seeing the differences. Uh, each of them yield a different kind of output and each of them could have different kind of reading for the same given urban scene. Um, if I connect the output of PT instead of UTCA, you notice that, of course, the nature of distribution is changed, but what does remain constant is that patches between the buildings tend to be hotter than the open area around them. In that case, this becomes PET. Right, so uh, the standard practice is to copy these values into Excel sheets, uh, and then you can calculate maximum, minimum, and average in Excel, or you could copy these values as well. And then once another simulation is run with green measures incorporated, uh, those values are compared to try and understand how many of them have moved from one band to the other, how, how many of them are within the comfortable zone, how many of them Um, I don't suppose the result has rotated. If you look at the distribution, it seems like the orientation remains the same. It won't rotate because uh, if I go back to the other file, the simulation file, uh, there's an option right over here called North. If it's at zero, then the thing doesn't get rotated. And of course, if you change this angle, the orientation 
the orientation of the model would be informed accordingly. Yes, that's right. Uh, I'm going to copy this to Excel. And when I copy it to Excel, what I see, uh, I have sort of made different formula to calculate what percentage is within the cool category and what percentage is within the slightly cool category. Uh, what it seems like is that uh, a lot of the surfaces, or rather a lot of the grid cells are in the cool category. And in fact, none of the grid cells are within the comfortable category. If we had a uh, topography in, in the shape files, you would find uh, a shape file, sorry, a topography related shape file as well. And then we need to incorporate that in writing the 3D file. And I think at the moment, if you're strictly restricting to cities which don't have topography, I don't suppose it would be reflected. Uh, most cities, not all, most cities do not have significant variation in height within the range of 200 meters or so. Um, if I... Uh, go to the folder that I shared with you guys. And if I go to the folder result underscore example, and if I then go to dragonfly config underscore output and copy this into let's say the result folder. and take a bit of time to read. <clears throat> Here, if I go to atmosphere, you'll see that in this, in this particular case, I have simulated it for more than 24 hours. So we can start picking the result from here, basically the next day. Uh, the way to pick a particular result from a bunch of simulations for the same scene with the same material is by first of all looking at this panel which lists the output files and if you sort of scroll down you'll start seeing um, the particular R. Let's say I want to see it for Four AM, which is the twenty ninth value, or has index value as twenty eight. So I have to connect a slider with the corresponding value into select item.
and accordingly it picks the value for that particular ad. So if let's say I move from um, 28 to the last one, which is let's say second last one, 36. It moves from day to night, and accordingly, you'll see a difference in the output or, or the value with respect to the early data that we have. So you, you see a lot of difference here, as you can see. Uh, because uh, we had not simulated it for more than 24 hours, Remember, I had simulated the one hour sample for 3 p.m. in the afternoon. There, the PET value had not gone beyond 25. The maximum was 23, I think. 23, yeah. Because it is directly reflective of the highest temperature of the, of the atmosphere at that moment. To actually see the reflection of heat island effect, and consequently uh, find the uh, effect of heat island effect on thermal stress or thermal comfort needs to be run those many extra hours, like I mentioned, 24 hours buffer plus the time period that you want to uh, simulate it for. So you can directly see the difference here. In reality, it does in, in this particular city go uh, get blisteringly hot, which is why we see PET of 54 Celsius, which is rather reflective of the reality compared to the value we had when we had just simulated it for one hour, which gave us values of 24 or 23 degrees at max. Right. Uh, okay. Now we'll head back to uh, the simulation file. I'll briefly talk about the different ways in which uh, other materials can be assigned and also discuss um, how relative humidity and tri-bulb temperature was connected. And first of all, I'm going to make sure I turn everything to false so that my uh, previously simulated files don't get overwritten. Right. Uh, to begin with, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the name of the project, which basically means it will be saved in a different uh, subfolder. I'm going to change it to with green measure. And from no green measure. And as soon as I do that, as expected, um, we do end up with this new folder. All right, I'll speak about material in a bit. Uh, let me just talk about these two inputs. Uh, dry bulb temperature and relative humidity, which are two fundamental input which go into uh, NVMet configuration. Uh, some of the other stuff it takes directly from the weather file. The moment we assign the uh, R of the year with the help of these three sliders, uh, this particular component automatically picks up the relative humidity for that particular day and the dry bulb temperature for that particular day as well, which are the two input needed to be 
used with this component, which in turn gets connected to the component which generates the simulation file. Um, there is one problem, however, that is uh, this particular component connected to the R of the year input gives us dry bulb temperature in Kelvin. Whereas the data or rather the input needed for NVMet to work properly works in Celsius, uh, which basically means you can either write a custom component or connect a bunch of multiplications and divisions, et cetera, to convert the Kelvin values of that particular day into uh, Celsius. Or alternatively, what I've done over here is so I've used this R of the year to basically cherry pick dry bulb temperature in Celsius directly from the EPW data types. Uh, so EPW gives us the dry bulb temperature in Celsius. However, it does so for every hour of the year. Uh, if we use the uh, number for the hour of the year generated using these three sliders, it basically gives us the index number of uh, the R for, for which the dry bulb temperature needs to be extracted and which is exactly what uh, this basically does. Uh, you pick out the dry bulb temperature value of that particular R and then from that R to the next 23 hours. So total 24 hours, uh, which you then connect to dry bulb temperature over here. So in a way, instead of converting kelvins to celsius using formulae because we already have um, dry bulb temperature um, given to us in celsius through the input epw component i've simply sort of picked the corresponding temperature uh, dry bulb temperature values uh, from this particular component um, Right, uh, I would share the Excel sheet with you. It's it's not complicated. It basically has a lot of simulation results stored, which is why it may look complicated. Let me simply calculate maximum, minimum, mean, variance, and median. These are straightforward Excel formula, but nonetheless, uh, after the end of the workshop, in about half an hour or 40 minutes time, I'll share the Excel sheet as well. Um, lastly, uh, we need to sort of change the material of a variety of these to sort of see what effect it may have and also incorporate 3D plants instead of 2D plants. Uh, keep in mind that because we are right now only simulating for an ad, there will be minuscule differences. However, uh, the differences won't be truly reflective of the on-ground condition because as I've been repeating, to know the exact action values for that R, we need 24 hours buffer simulation in front of it. So we would in effect need 25 hours of simulation for one hour of simulation. But regardless of that, well, it's our job right now is to basically see the workflow and not worry about the results as such. Uh, to begin with, let's first address uh, let's first address the road. If I connect XML to XML reader, if you remember, asphalt road with red coating has higher albedo value, which is why I'm going to pick that which is the third last, third last happens to be 0100AR. 
and if I scroll to root, uh, I'm going to pick that 0100AR. Secondly, uh, instead of clay, I am going to assign grass onto uh, the soil. which was bare to begin with. Um, the way to assign grass is the same as this. You can use plant and then assign grass. Or you could try looking for another option called greening. main settings. All right, so we don't, I mean, if you wish you could connect uh, additional data here as well. So you could connect specific humidity and relative humidity and all of the rest of the data over here as well, but we are not sure how the algorithm works for the separate components. But what we have noticed, and when I say we, I don't mean just me and my company or my peers. I mean, everyone who's been using uh, these components have noticed that uh, it doesn't make any difference. As long as the tribal temperature and relative humidity is connected to other settings, uh, connected to main setting or not doesn't make much difference. Yeah, in case you do wish to feed them, you can pick the corresponding data from here. The import EPW component has all of them listed over here. So for example, if you're using wind speed, then using this value, the R of the year, you can use list item to pick the value corresponding to wind speed and then connect it to uh, main settings. Someone was asking me about uh, the wind direction. If you look at the description of our wind direction, it goes from zero to 360. So it's, it's not really restricted to the Cartesian directions or 45 degrees in between or 30 degrees divided, so on and so forth. It's sort of flat out goes from zero to 360. Uh, if you go to greening, you'll see a variety of uh, options. Uh, green plus sandy loam substrate, green plus mixed substrate, et cetera, and et cetera. Uh, and this I'm changing for bare. Uh, <clears throat> I'll pick the first one because we've just replaced soil with grass. And lastly, for vegetation, if you have to use 3D plant, then we can use NVMet 3D plant where um, we can connect vegetation to, of course, the first input, which would be the geometry, and then we can select the plant type. That remains, that process remains the same. You copy this and within description, you'll see a variety of options. Uh, some of which go as I asked 20 meters or so. It also sort of explains uh, how it's going to treat the crown. Is it going to be uh, dense 
or less dense, distinct crown layer or not, so on and so forth. So, so instead of 2D plant, you connect it to 3D plant. Um, anyway, uh, the moment we connect it to 3D plant, again, it increases the simulation time. We don't have that amount of time at the moment. So I'm simply going to uh, keep the changes restricted to uh, changing the bare soil to grass and changing the road to asphalt uh, with red coating. Um, and while the rest of the data is the same, let's go ahead and simulate this. So if we look at the NVMet file that gets written, let's just, before every simulation, I switch it to true just to make sure that the preview, et cetera, is right. In fact, yeah, it is right. And now let's go ahead and see the output of the simulation. Uh, Turn to true and turn to true. And I'm going to switch off my video feed for a while. Don't want the machine to be overstretched in terms of computation power. And so again, this will take about 10 minutes or so. So till then, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A window or the chat window. Uh, we can add as many layers in the wall structure. The, the way to do that is the, is the same way to assign grass with a different kind of uh, soil attribute, that is to make a new material. You can head over to NVMet and assign new materials. And you can add as many layers as you want. Could be customized to the way, let's say you're designing a building. If you're using uh, insulation with uh, air gap, along with different layers of substructure, then we can, we could uh, sort of define that as well. Well, at the crux hi, of it, it's, sorry. I was just saying hi, Joy, David here. Hi, David. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, this process is typically used in two cases. Number one is that uh, once, let's say you're designing a campus or you're designing some sort of urban intervention uh, once you've decided on the built mass, uh, you run the simulation to identify pockets which either get too hot or too cold. And then locally through active design measures, you try and address those. Uh, 
the other way of doing it is of course to uh, if the project is such or if the research is such that uh, you can sort of um, add uh, materials that are quote unquote greener than the typical ones or the conventional ones then you can sort of have a cost benefit analysis wherein cost obviously is the inflated cost of using green materials and the benefit would be the reduced slabs of uh, uncomfortable sensation be it in the uh, too hot category or the too cold category. 